Okay, cool. Yep. How many people did we have registered? Uh, 20. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, my experience on these is it usually takes three or four minutes to get people in. Yeah, we'll give them. We trimmed out a few things off the agenda, so I think okay. we'll save those minutes elsewhere. Yep, should be good. I'll wait. I'll wait till like maybe nine oh four or nine oh five. Certainly, wait till we at least have a full board. Hi, Liz. Good morning. Yep. I've topped off my coffee. I'm good to go. Wonderful. Um, Liz, I was wondering, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Would you possibly be able to take notes? Yes. Okay, if I can send you um, the framework that we set, um, if that would be helpful. All right. I wonder if Vicki, you haven't heard from Vicki, have you? Uh, no. Alan, no. Okay. Trying not to talk with my mouth full, Tyler. Um, I saw her Thursday night. She said she was going to be here. Okay. Yep. Good deal. Hi, Stu. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? Thank you. Good, good. Thanks for being here. Hey, Stu. Hey, Fallon. Good to Happy see you. Happy Saturday. Thanks for and to you. taking your weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, Liz, I just sent them to you, so let me know if um, they go, don't go through, I guess. Okay. Cool. All right, last call for coffee, everybody. All right, I got mine. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, Dale. Morning. Good morning. I've got my coffee too. Good. Perfect. I've Hi. already had my two cups, so. Perfect. You have a yeah. hard cut off. Two cups. Just jacked right now. <laughs> Is, it hard, Is it like a hard cut off at two? You're like, okay. That's it for the day. Yeah, it used to be three or four or five or six or however much was in the pot, but oh, yes. I'm trying to cut back. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to get more into tea recently, just so I don't, I'm not like so jittery and wired. I feel like yeah. I'm naturally that way enough. So <laughs> it's a bit too much <laughs> together. Maybe we should do a toast at the, the start to kick it off, like a breakfast toast. There you go. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> to all of us. <laughs> Mommy. Hey, Michael. Good morning. This is my third cup of coffee, by the way. I'll probably have to stop there. We haven't had any coffee because our coffee co our coffee pot malfunctioned this morning. Oh no! <laughs> we really need to go next door. <laughs> Major <laughs> disaster. Coffee and coffee. <laughs> you just got to put it in your cereal. <laughs> oh yeah! With all the grit that was in it, it probably would have been great. <laughs> Here's Teresa. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning, Teresa. Yeah. Good morning. Guys, I have my wash almost done. This is my wash my winter blanket and put my spring blanket on. I hope I'm not using the gods here. <laughs> yeah, we're flirting next week. Yeah. Looks like. Yeah. Well, today's we the official need... first day of spring, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, or was it yesterday? The 19th? Mm. Or is it tomorrow, the 21st? <laughs> it actually varies year by year. It's usually around the 21st, but the equinox can shift within about a 24-hour period, depending yeah. on the 
But anyway, I really appreciate the extra light. You know, I don't mind cold, it's the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to have uh, a little more light in the evening here now. Yeah. You like daylight savings. I guess uh, I like it at night, but I didn't like it Sunday morning last week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess to me, it's I'm sort of impartial to what the clock says. It's more about the length of daylight and the ability to get things done outside. Yeah. Yeah, it is nice to have that extra hour. One time. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, I'm just, I think we should get going here just in case we start getting short on time. Um, we have a few, probably a few folks who will trickle in um, based on the registration numbers, but um, uh, so first thing I'm just going to go, first off, thanks everyone for showing up to our annual meeting and um, uh, coming out to see what the central chapter's been up to and, and has planned uh, for this coming year. Um, I'm just going to go around and quick, just kind of go through who the board is currently. We currently have a five member board. Uh, I'm Tyler Carlson. I'm from Sock Center. I'm board chair. Um, we have Dale Reinke uh, from Wadena. She's vice chair and, and also our state uh, chapter delegate. And we have Joe Lutmer, uh, the tre our treasurer from Alexandria. And Liz Pullman from Melrose is our secretary. And Vicki Kettlewell from Brainerd is on our board. And also Shane Johnson from, I believe, Pillager, uh, the Pillager area is on our board as well. Um, so I think we have, uh, we have some openings on the board and we'll be, you know, discussing that a little bit later. But I just wanted to go through and highlight who is the current board. And then um, the first, we just have a quick order of business for today um, to look at uh, last year's uh, annual meeting uh, minutes. So Fallon, if you could bring that up on the screen, we can um, proceed with that. Can you see this? Yes, I can. Okay, good deal. Um, so for the board, um, any discussion on last year's annual meeting minutes? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve said minutes. I would motion to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Joe to approve last year's annual meeting minutes. Do I have a second? Yes, I will second the motion. I have a second by Liz. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <clears throat> Motion carries all in favor. Okay, thank you. Um, so then I just have some uh, sort of some comments to sort of highlight where we've been and where we're going. And then we'll jump into a few more sort of central chapter specific reports and some presentations before our uh, two guest presenters starting at around 10 a.m. Yeah, that's great. So let's just skip right over to the next slide there. Thank you, okay. So a year in review, um, obviously last year presented more than a few challenges um, to in-person networking with COVID as we're all too familiar with. And, um, but even, even so we were able to have a few field days and um, you know, we kicked off, I think it was early summer, maybe late spring. I don't remember the exact time, but I was there at the uh, Central Lakes College for uh, an orchard field day. It was uh, Thaddeus McCammon's last day, I believe, on the job before heading out um, towards, I think, Montana to start or work on a, a, his own uh, sort of commercial orchard out there. So we were, it was great to be able to sort of uh, squeeze some, squeeze some uh, expert knowledge out of, out of Thaddeus before he, uh, before he left the region. And, um, yeah, it was a small group of maybe 10 or so folks, including Thaddeus, you know, so it was pretty easy to, um, you know, stay distant. And um, yeah, it was just a really nice way to uh, spend a couple hours out in the orchard and um, some really good discussion happened there. And yeah, it was nice. I felt like it didn't take a lot of, uh, it didn't take a lot of coordinating or work to put that on. And I really felt like just as the chair, it was like, we should just do a lot more 
just kind of like, let's just get some stuff on the calendar. And if four people show up, awesome. You know, it's great. Let, let's just, if it's, if it's low, low overhead, let's do it. And then um, we had several other events, a lot of things, you know, that didn't happen over the year, but we had a few other things that we were able to get done, including a hedging workshop last fall. I believe it was October 17th comes to mind um, at Island Lake farm uh, with uh, Jim and Audra and fam. Um, really, really interesting uh, kind of live hedging workshop out there. As you can see, I guess, yeah, we've got a photo of it there on the right. Um, and so uh, they've been working on that, I think just the last uh, maybe a couple years or so, but um, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to like going out there again next fall or, or in a couple of years and just continue working on it. And after 10 years, after 10 years, we'll have like a big old, you know, serious hedge that can maybe keep goats in and stuff. So um, that was really fun and a good way to get out. We were also planning a, a kayaking day as the afternoon for that, but uh, it was extremely cold. And so we punted that. Um, we also had some silvopasture workshops around the region. Um, we had one scheduled for at our farm here in Sox Center that we, we canceled. And actually we're gonna be doing this year um, in June, we'll see that later on. But um, we did, we were able to have three um, silvo pasture field days around the state, including one here in the central region at Sun Up Ranch at board member Vicki Kettlewell um, and Greg Booth's uh, ranch there by Brainerd. And um, so that was, you know, that was really great to get that, get that done. It was an, also another kind of chilly day, but um, pretty well attended. And um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we had a number of, we had a number of like resource professionals, foresters, NRCS, SWC type there. And um, I was pretty impressed. I felt like, you know, we had some really good staff in the Northern part of the state who really have quite a bit of, of knowledge under their belt already on silvopasture or at least the components of it. And so putting the pieces together into uh, really good silvopasture design systems felt like something they were ready for. So uh, that was something I remember from that day. And then uh, also at Sun Up Ranch. So Sun Up Ranch was doing some pretty heavy lifting on the, 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 the in-person field, field days last summer. Um, they also had a Kurt Pate uh, stockmanship workshop, which I was not able to make, but I heard uh, from folks who did make it there that it was uh, extremely valuable. And um, I believe we, yeah, as a chapter, we co-sponsored um, one or both of those two events. And then, um, yeah, so... I think, you know, we had a number of events that kind of didn't happen because of COVID or events that were, you know, pretty substantially modified because of COVID. Um, and as a result, you know, towards the fall, we started to think about how we could still get together during winter when um, being outside gets more challenging, distancing is more challenging, et cetera. And so um, we formed a, we formed a book club um, called the bookworms and we're, finishing up our last book um and we'll talk about that a little bit more later so i won't i won't dive into that too far right now but i'll it'll be coming up here in a minute so next slide please Fallon. okay and so i don't remember when we specifically sent this out it might have been like last spring or maybe it was summer we sent this out to the membership to we really we've been really struggling to get you know obviously with COVID, it's hard to get people out and it just felt like we really needed to get a better sense as a board what the membership wants. So we sent out um, a survey to try and kind of nail down what folks are interested in and, and maybe even just why in the first place people decide to join and be members of our chapter or SFA um, broadly. And um, so we have results back from that. We got some really good information and um, we're going to use that information to uh, guide and, and, you know, really try to target some of the, the bigger responses for our programming going forward. Um, by my, these are all these uh, soil health, cover cropping, orchard production, vegetable production, processing, green energy, silvo pasture, climate adaptation were all things that were brought up. Um, as, as, as programming that our members were interested in. Um, the big hitters that I remember were soil health, um, cover cropping, and silvopasture. And, um, you know, 
really the results kind of fit with a lot of the things that we had already been planning as a board. So I think that that felt, that felt good to us that like, you know, we, we were able to kind of, you know, have a good sense. Jim, you want to talk or are you just playing around with the emojis or? Playing around with buttons. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so we'll, we'll be doing, yeah, anyways, you'll see these events coming up, but we have these responses and we're, um, you know, these results from the surveys and we'll be using that to try to guide some of our programming. And um, yeah, outside of those specific topics, another thing that came back was big, big in the survey was just that people generally just want to network. You know, a big part of joining SFA was just community building, you know, and making connections to people locally who are doing something similar. Um, and maybe connections that, you know, are, are just like, just good for their business. Um, but also just, I think the social aspect of just networking is something that was, that came through in the survey. Um, so next slide. So, um, yeah, so here's what's kind of on deck for the next at least six months, you know, out to a year or so. Um, We've got a green energy event scheduled for June 21st at Joe Lutmer's in Alec. And, um, you know, I think we'll have some more information coming out on that pretty soon here, along with some registration uh, details. Um, we could talk more about that later if we have more time, I think. But, I, you know, I think we're looking to get some, some renewable energy experts out to talk about things and how green energy and solar, you know, it's this cases specifically solar panels, but probably green energy generally um, can fit in with, with farms. Um, so if that's something of interest to you, watch for that registration opportunity to come up soon. Um, Salsa Fest, SFA's big flagship uh, fall harvest festival was not held last year due to COVID, though we were holding out hope most of the year. But um, we have a lot of good momentum in Salsa Fest from 2019. Um, it was held at, in Wadena and the city of Wadena was, was very uh, pleased with how that went and they were very happy with the results. The city received a lot of good feedback from you know, citizens and attendees. And um, so this, the city is doing a lot of work and is very excited to uh, work with SFA going forward to host that again this fall. So, oh, Please watch for that and um, put that in your calendar and plan to attend if you, if you can. Um, next is silvopasture events. We have at least for sure two events that will be, uh, you know, in-person field events. Well, I should say, you know, barring, barring major change, but um, in some capacity, we will have two in-person and field days. Um, one is a volunteer event that will be at our farm here in Sox Center. Again, it was the one that was supposed to be last year, but we're doing it this year. It's on June 12th. Um, the registration for that will be coming out. Great River Greening is kind of coordinating that. It's a volunteer kind of work event a little bit. Um, there'll be a small amount of training on it, but for the most part, we'll be doing some uh, some oak savanna restoration where we're seeding native grasses and legumes into a, a sort of cleared, you know, afforested savanna that we've cleared. And we're gonna be planting some oak trees inside of our existing pine silvopasture pasture uh, as kind of a succession uh, for when the pines are gone. And then um, we will have a field day. Right now we're looking to nail one down up in Ashby but uh, for sure there will be a field day in uh, our region, the central region, um, looking like late July. So again, if, if silvo pasture is something you're interested in and you'll be around the area late July, watch for those events coming out. That should be nailed down here in the next couple weeks, I think. Um, so just watch the general SFA uh, communications on that. And then we're looking, so last fall, we were also hoping to do a canning workshop um, but a canning workshop in the fall just felt like it was too challenging to get done because of COVID. So um, hopefully COVID will be um, allowing, you know, fewer restrictions um, this fall. If so, we, we are hoping to do a canning and fermenting workshop at, at either one, you know, a farm or, or possibly at Sprout. Um, those details are still to be worked out. And um, 
So that's another theme, generally like food preservation, cooking, that kind of, we're looking to like kind of expand programming around you know, <laughs> what, what we do with food after it's been grown. Um, and that kind of ties in with the community building and networking. Um, we're looking to generally just kind of with all of these events and also just standalone events to do a lot more where it's just, it's less about coming to a field day and downloading some information for you to take home to your farm. It's as much about just getting together with people in our local area, having some fun, networking with people who maybe are not farming right now, but have interests in farms or have interests in sustainable agriculture and just trying to connect with uh, more diverse sort of interest groups around sustainable agriculture. And uh, so some of that like food processing and cooking and things like that is an area where we can also um, create a lot of fun spaces to connect and share knowledge and things um, while checking that box of, of greater, more broad networking. Um, and that kind of goes back to some of the events like, you know, the kayaking thing after Jim and Audra's after the field day at Island, the hedging workshop was kind of like, well, let's, you know, let's just go out and have a little fun too for an hour or whatever on the water. And we were hoping to do some cross country skiing maybe or snowshoeing in the winter, but uh, it just, yeah, it just all got too complicated. But those kind of things, just kind of a little bit more like activity, fun based kind of stuff. We're just trying to roll that into some of our programming and make it a little bit less just sort of educate, you know, everything just strictly educational download at the farm kind of thing. So broadening our concepts of, you know, the reasons we get together and how we get together in the spaces we get together. Um, Excuse me, Tyler, if I, can yeah. just, if I can add one quick one. Yeah, I do, I do have confirmation from John Lederman to do cover crop field day at his farm just northwest of Alexandria. Perfect. Uh, he's been cover cropping for a long time now and has a lot of great experience to bring to bear for anyone interested in that. And he'd like to do it sometime mid-September. That's perfect. We haven't had, in my, to my knowledge, we haven't had a lot of work on cover crops in the, in the in the central chapter area. So I'm excited to be able to add that. And especially because the survey showed that um, our membership wants to see that stuff. So if you're interested in cover crops, um, watch for that date when it comes out. So we'll probably lock that date. I'm guessing we'll probably try to lock a date down at our next regular scheduled board meeting um, or sometime soon. So thanks, Joe. Yep. Uh, the bookworms, that's the book club. Um, we just finished well, we're just finishing. I think we have one more uh, meeting on our first book, which is Eric Holthouse's um, The Future Earth. Uh, there's a longer subtitle that I've, I'm missing right now, but it's The Future Earth. It's a, it's a fairly interesting, um, you know, read on um, sort of what, what the next three decades look like if we tackle climate change, um, you know, to the level that he thinks we need to. Um, if we're going to be successful, I guess. And so, um, yeah, we've had some really interesting discussion on, I think we've had about like maybe eight or nine folks on that book club, several board members. Um, and yeah, out of that has been some really great discussion. I'm every time we meet, we meet for, I think it's just a little, maybe an hour or just over an hour. And it doesn't feel like nearly enough time for all the discussions we want to have. And so I think, um, I'll just say, um, well, yeah. So we have one more meeting. You're all still, anyone who, isn't, who hasn't been a part of it could join. You don't necessarily have to have read the book to, in order to be able to join in and, and listen to the conversations that we're having. Um, but we will be, I don't know if we're gonna have another one here over the growing season or not. We may start one up fairly soon after this one is completed or else it will be more of an off season, you know, winter time kind of thing. So um, anyways, if a book club is something you're interested in, just, um, or if you have ideas of uh, books you, you think would be great, please plug that to the chapter. Um, so out of that too, you know, because this book focused on climate, we um, sort of decided that it would be interesting. And I think, um, uh, I think good to form something of an offshoot that would continue to look at um, sort of climate, you know, looking at, um, how farms can be uh, more climate resilient and adaptive and, and to what extent farms can play a role in climate mitigation. 
um, and, and other things, you know, things that we should be, you know, maybe looking at and, and trying to understand for, for, you know, policies that are related to climate that are maybe outside of the realm of agriculture, just more general, like energy sector things. But um, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential to make and connect most of our field days and events and work to the realm of climate adaptation or mitigation. And um, I, I personally am very interested in trying to go deeper into this topic as a chapter. Um, so we have a small group, I think, for sure now that will be, you know, signing up for that from that book club. And then we'll be opening that up to the broader chapter. So if climate and adaptation, mitigation, anything, all things climate are of interest to you, um, yeah, I'd really encourage folks to, to join us on this, uh, this sort of deep dive working group. I don't know what the, I called it a climate working group. Nothing's official yet. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just generally the state obviously has a lot of great programming around soil health, the silvo pasture stuff. Um, I mean, lots of policy and like the PDP uh, or PPP fund. I mean, like this, just watch the state level because there's so many great programs and grants and webinars and podcasts and field days all over um so just uh, keep an eye out for that and there's plenty of virtual things um that can that you can continue to connect with there um with that i think that's the last slide for my um my sort of opening remarks i guess um and i think yeah i think from here i'm going to i'm going to uh hand over the mic so to speak to Teresa Kiveny our executive director for a short presentation on some programming and things available to the chapter Thank you, Tyler. And thanks to, uh, can folks hear me okay? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm having uh, connectivity issues. So actually I'm gonna shut my video off. Hello. <laughs> um, and thanks for the segue. First, uh, kudos to your chapter for starting a book group and doing a survey and actually doing some pretty, um, interesting programming in the year of COVID. I will say creativity definitely um, showed itself within SFA over the last year. And I wanna say that um, your last annual meeting was one of the first that we switched, I think maybe to, it was the first that got switched to an online format. I remember that was a bit um, traumatic and now um, it seems like old hat. Um, I wanted to highlight three or four different programs that we have that may be of interest, and I'll put a few things in the chat. Um, first, Tyler mentioned PPP, and that, of course, is the Payroll Protection Program, uh, and that is from um, the first couple of CARES Acts that passed in Congress, and when these pieces of legislation came down, we, along with Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture and other allies like Renewing the Countryside and, um, oh gosh, the Farmers Market Association and Farmers Union came together. And all through the summer and fall and even spring, we held a series of workshops and did another one this year um, to educate people on how to apply for these different programs. And those are recorded. And we did do one last month on the PPP. I encourage you, if you have not applied to do so, if you are a farmer or a small business person, this round, the application deadline is March 31st. SFA actually applied because our ability to do fundraising and even to do timely performance on grants was inhibited. And so we got a small PPP loan, which will um, turn into a grant here in the next month or so. So I will put the link for that in the chat if you want to watch the video. Um, it also is translated into Hmong and Spanish. Most of the educational videos that we did last year, the webinars um, dealing with the emergency programs have been translated and that's courtesy more of Department of Agriculture and MISA. So that's one thing. Don't, um, it's not a hard application process, but there are some little quirks 
And that money is really there to invest in rural communities and agriculture. So um, don't say no until you, it, uh, if you think you are up, you know, eligible until you've actually looked at the at the video. Um, yesterday or the day before, a small gift fell into our laps. Uh, folks may know Ryan Pesh. He is from Pelican Rapids, and he's actually involved in our Lake Agassiz chapter. Uh, he is an extension educator and has resources and time available through his job to do coaching for up to 20 farmers, mainly specialty crop, um, and that could include uh, poultry and livestock as well for marketing. And in particular, it's intended to work with people who need or are planning on a change due to COVID. Maybe you're adding another crop. Maybe you have decided that you're going to do um, wholesale. Maybe you are going to start a CSA. What his coaching would do is an initial meeting with you. He wants to do all initial meetings really started in April. Um, he would do a check-in meeting in the summer and another one at the end of the summer, unless a person really wanted his time front-loaded. He has time for up to 20. They're making this available first to SFA and to our network, which can include members and non-members. So I'll put in the chat his um, email and phone number, and all you need to do is contact him. You don't need to apply to us. You don't need, he doesn't have an application form. He basically needs to hear what it is that you need. The only uh, restriction would be he doesn't want to work with someone who has not farmed before. It's not going to teach beginning farming, though he would be happy to work with someone who has a year or two under their belt who might be making changes due to COVID. And while COVID changes um, are what has inspired the funding behind this, um, it could be a change in your operation or a small tweak that you've been thinking about for a while. So uh, we encourage you to take advantage of that. And Tyler, I don't know if he um, has background in, so I don't think he has background in civil pasture, but I would be curious um, how he would advise on some on a civil pasture um, question or enterprise. Um, similar to the support from Ryan, we also have, it's through our uh, CCHD funding, um, additional monies available for people to register for farm financial management training. And the program that we're working with is through uh, Cornell University. And um, there's an application form. Um, the program is a six week online for one, I believe one hour. I, it's a self-directed program. You can schedule it as I understand it um, if you can't make this, the live classes. Um, and we would pay the, it's a $299 tuition for the lower income applicant and we would pay that. And we did have Eight people go through that program. The first round, we have funds for up to 25, and we'd certainly like to get more people who want more training on farm financial management. So um, that one, uh, actually I'm gonna follow up a separate email on that because we have a new tweak to the application form. And I thought we'd start by sending it out to all of our chapter boards. We're trying to do more um, hands-on education about some of the programs in farm financial management as a way to give more foundational support to both beginning farmers. Um, we're doing some of the educational programming in other languages, so it helps emerging farmers and people of color. Um, I wanted to just touch on one other program that we have going that might be of interest and it speaks to some of your priorities. It's called the Conservation Connections Program. Some of you may have been uh, in attendance when we did it during our annual conference. Um, uh, we have a team of three staff um, and consultants who basically teach about how they're doing 
conservation and soil health practices on their farms, and then what NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service programs, uh, support those. So that could be if you wanted to do a standalone webinar exclusively for your chapter, um, they're available to do that and funded to do that. So we're in partnership with Renewing the Countryside on that. One of the things that we found is if there's a particular aspect of agriculture, for example, uh, in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin cohort did one on grazing and um, talked about the NRCS programs that were applicable. And that was very well attended. And you can usually tell if a webinar is successful if people stay until the end and if your Q&A and your chat box are lively. And uh, that has been the situation with these presentations. Um, lastly, I, I want to applaud you for starting a climate working group. Um, at the last SFA board meeting in February, I asked the board about their interest and willingness to authorize a group like that at the state level to help shape our work in the context of either climate adaptation or um, ways to look at regenerative agriculture as um, sort of the core solution or a key solution in farm country to the climate crisis. Um, and I believe Tyler raised his hand to be on that committee. Joe, I'm hoping that you could help us out in your service, you and Sylvia, as climate land leaders. Um, we mentioned you, your ears might have been ringing. I think we'll bring that uh, committee together really early in April, like the first week of April. Um, in part is to inform me um, and help us think through how we shape our programs so that we can pursue funding through the McKnight Foundation, which has eliminated the Mississippi River Program, which is where we got our funding, but is placing a major emphasis on climate adaptation and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, then lastly, a year ago, we did a survey of chapter leadership and our statewide board you may have participated in it, asking what leadership development programs are of interest. And we were able to only do a few of them because a lot of them we thought were best done face-to-face. -face. One dealt with um, both having discussions on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we can more effectively reach out to farmers of color and communities of color who work in the agricultural industry. And I wanted to see if that is still of interest. Um, one opportunity we have is to do, um, to, to bring a person in to work with us to sort of do a mix of um, webinar discussions that give us homework uh, that would culminate in a face-to-face -face kind of retreat in the fall where we really have done some outreach and bring others to the to that um, retreat. And I wanna see, are you guys interested in that? Let me stop there, maybe ask questions overall and expressly if you can let me know about your interest in the very last item. Great, thanks Great. Teresa. Go ahead, anyone, uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself, yep. Uh, I'll be willing to participate in the uh, climate working group. Thanks, Joe. And uh, bring, bring whatever experiences uh, we have from other groups as well. I think even the initial meeting, I will be asking folks to, there'll be a little homework coming into the initial meeting so that we're not completely starting from scratch. Homework. Thanks. Uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm interested in school. I'm interested in working on the climate working group. Thanks, Vicki. All righty. Um, how about any interest on, well, you all can talk about your interest in whether you want to bring in our team on conservation connections. And we also do have 
plenty of programming on soil health. Um, what about interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, both examining our own opportunities and obstacles and also giving skills and kind of homework, if you will, on more outreach to communities of color in your area? Yeah, I think we need to do this. Personally, I think this is kind of a little bit an SFA's blind spot. Um, this isn't. This is a general area that I think we could we could do a lot more work on, and um, it's really broad. Um, but I think, yeah, we have definitely even just as a chapter, I think we have some opportunities to engage with a more diverse community um, just in our region. I'd like to do more of that. Yeah, and, and this is this is Joy Hoppy. Um, I would be very interested in helping with that if there's any opportunity for some, you know, organizing in advance. Great. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I think that I, I would definitely be interested in that as well. And I think that I've had actually a couple of conversations this week that would be directly relevant to that. Uh, Jim and I, Jim Chamberlain and I were actually on a phone call earlier this week with um, a woman by the name of um, Monica, I can't remember her last name, but she works for LEDC. Yeah. Um, and is working on land access for the Latinx population in Long Prairie. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think this is really relevant and something we should be working on. Yes. Um, before I forget, Fallon, can, if you haven't put them in contact with the farmland access navigators, um, I can also follow up with you on that. There's a but lot of things, they, yeah, there's a lot of things right now. They're, they, they're putting sorry, their yeah. plan together. Well, I will, for sure, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's just expressly a program that does work with emerging farmers and it, it has successfully placed, matched 46 farmers over the last two years, gotten mm -hmm. them farmland, including some, some farmers of color. Great. Yeah. Right now they're addressing more like having culturally appropriate foods available. And I guess I'm jumping to what I think is a solution. So <laughs> is land access. So, so, oh, I see. Steps there. so that's not where they're at yet, but that's where I'm trying to get them. <laughs> but um, yeah. I'm trying to get them, but yeah, just we're working, we're working towards a lot of different um, initiatives to help facilitate their goals. So um, anyways, if we don't, if we're done there, we do um, have to move on to make sure that we're making, uh, we're being fair. To thanks students. a lot, you guys. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. Have a good meeting. And if anyone else wants to, you know, jump in with some of the things that Teresa mentioned, you could probably contact her directly or, or reach out to, to, you know, the central chapter for more information. Um, so real quick, we'll move on to treasurer's report uh, from Joe. Um, go ahead, Joe. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to be giving all these numbers in to the nearest dollar amount. Um, I'll also point out for everyone's information that SFA runs its fiscal year from July through June. So this report is for first half of our 2020-2021 uh, fiscal year from July of 2020 through December of 2020. So I'll start with income. We had income of $960 from membership dues. And uh, for anyone interested in becoming a member or continuing membership, if you designate your membership as central chapter, then the income comes directly into uh, the central chapter account. Um, in addition to that, we had $1,800 in donations of greater than $250. And then we had a grant from the Five Wings Arts Council for $4,100 that's earmarked for Salsa Fest, but since we canceled Salsa Fest this year. We have not used that money yet. Uh, so from July through December, we had income of $6,860. On the expense side, we had um, $1,334 in expenses for uh, chapter coordinator wages and expenses. Um, we spent $500 on um, chapter 
uh, workshop events. And we spent $500 that we gave as a contribution to Emerging Farmers Working Group uh, to help pay a facilitator with a group of emerging farmers that are helping develop uh, policy, legislative policy uh, with the Minnesota Department of Ag and the state legislature. Um, so that brings our total expenses for the six months to uh, $2,335 and uh, a net income for the period of $4,524. And that left us with um, $9,994 in our checking account at the end of December. And so far in the current year, we really haven't had much in the way of expenses. Um, and part of the reason that we had that amount of gain is the fact that we had to cancel Salsa Fest, but we're in a really great position financially this year to help sponsor workshops and events, as well as to fund um, the Salsa Fest for this year. Um, so we're, we're going to be able to do uh, live music as well as sponsor some other uh, art workshops up in uh, in Wadena on September 18th this year. So really, really looking forward to that. And, and we're pretty confident that by September we'll be in a place where uh, the vaccinations are ubiquitous enough to make it a safe event. So that's the treasurer's report. Any questions? All good. Thank you, Joe. I will Thank just you. say too that I think that that uh, emerging farmers working group most of the chapters in the state were invited to contribute to that and so I, I, I know we weren't I don't know if they all did but I know that we were I'm pretty sure we were not the only ones to contribute to that uh, that effort. Anyway so then next on the list is a, a state board update from Dale. Um, whatever you got take it away. Well um, actually Teresa took a few of the things I was going to mention. Um, so my, um, my report is very, very brief in that it was, it's been really fun seeing what's been going on at the state board level and um, just sharing what we've been doing. They've been, everyone has been really positive with our activities that we've been doing. And um, the, the PPP encouragement to, to apply to that and yeah, most of the things that Teresa covered were several of the things I had down to mention that she had, that we had talked about at our last meeting. So I'll keep this really brief and say thank you. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun going between these two groups and I enjoy it. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, Dale. Okay. One last thing before we move on to the presenters, I think we've got enough time here um, for election of, of board members. Um, we will do the elections for executive committee members uh, at our next regularly scheduled um, board meeting on the first Tuesday of every month, April 6th is the next one. So tonight, or here, sorry, this morning here, we will just, um, we will nominate and elect new board members. Um, so with that, I will open up the floor to the board to, um, make those nominations. I'll go first. I renominate, um, I'll make a motion to renominate Liz Pullman to the Central Chapter Board. And I'll second that nomination. I have a motion by Joe to second the renomination of Liz Pullman to the board discussion. Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by stating aye. Aye. Um, aye. Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead, this, Joe. Is only to, this is only to approve the nomination, not, not a vote at this point, correct? Correct. Okay. So, sorry. No, nope, that's good. I can, I'll recall it. All those in favor of the motion to approve Liz, re to, to, um, <laughs> to reapprove the nomination of Liz Pullman to the board, signify by aye. stating aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries all in favor. Okay, and any other nominations? One, Go ahead, Joe. Comment, any, anyone can nominate, not just board members. Okay, yeah, good, yeah, anyone at all, please. And then I think we have Joe, Joe and, and Fallon, how many members, is it a nine-member board? 
Yes, our intent is to be a nine member board. Um, we, in the past, we were down to a seven member board. Um, and then we've had two resignations for, for various reasons. Um, so I think we, we actually currently have, is it four? <clears throat> Five openings, Fallon. Five. Four. Four. Okay, so we have four openings, so we're hoping to get at least four nominations. Yeah, with the re with the presumed, you know, full vote to reappoint Liz, that would leave four remaining spots. Just so everyone's aware. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like to nominate Michael Salzel. I have a motion by Liz to nominate Michael Salzel to the board. <laughs> I second the motion. Oh, I need, I think I need a board member to second it. I, oh, I, sorry. Yeah, I will no, second. no problem. Thanks, Deb. Uh, Vic, I have a second by Vicki to nominate Michael Salzel to the board. Any discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries all in favor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll make a motion to nominate Kyle McClure, who is not here today, but I've spoken to him and he's willing and very excited to be on the board. He's from Sock Center. He's also been a member of our uh, Bookworms Book Club. Yeah, I would uh, certainly second that nomination. I have a motion by myself and a second by Joe to nominate Kyle McClure to the board. Any uh, further discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries all in favor. Thank you. Any further nominations? Um, I would like to nominate John Thompson and Ariel Thompson. I don't know if you can, should I just do one at a time? Um, Ariel, is that your last name? I'm sorry, I assumed. Yes, it is, yep. <laughs> <clears throat> Does anyone have a have any reason we couldn't do both at the same time? No. Okay, we'll do. Uh, so I have a motion by Fallon to nominate John. I'm sorry, John and and what was your name? Ariel. 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 Yeah. Okay, John. Okay, I have a motion by Fallon to nominate John and Ariel Thompson to the board. Do I have a second? I second the motion. I have a second by Liz Pullman. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <clears throat> Motion carries. Thank you. Any further nominations? I believe that's. I wanted to oppose that because I think it's going to be a, 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 par a grandparenting day when, when board meetings come around. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just how it rolls, Jim. That's just how that goes. Jim, you're not allowed to oppose that. <laughs> um, have, go ahead. Tyler, is it appropriate to make a motion to close nominations? You can, it's absolutely, it's certainly an appropriate, yeah, unless, yeah, you go ahead and do that. Um, I will just say maybe real quickly, does anyone have any further nominations? Okay, then certainly, Liz, I think it's a okay. So to... let's close nominations, Tyler. I have a motion by Liz to close nominations for the board. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second by Joe. Discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, motion carries all in favor. Nomination period is closed. Okay, moving on to the vote. Do I have a motion to approve the nominations? That have just been made to the board. Uh, we can do it all in one uh, carry, can't we? Yep. Okay. Yes, we can. Good. Um, I make a motion to um, approve the slate of nominees, including Michael Salzel, Kyle McClure, John Thompson, and Ariel Thompson. Perfect. Thank you. Do I have a second? I will second. I have a second to that to to the motion by Vicky. Discussion. Uh, I would just add Liz, uh, Liz's name to that. Since oh, I, I, yes, oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, let, don't forget me. <laughs> I have a motion by Liz to approve John Thompson, Ariel Thompson, Michael Salzel, and Kyle McClure to the board. And Liz. And, and as, and, 
What? Sorry. Didn't I say that? Oh. And, and Liz. But we can and Liz. That. Yes, right. As a renomination. Thank you. No, that's yes. I've motioned by Liz to approve the nominations of Liz Pullman, John Thompson, Ariel Thompson, Michael Salzel, and Kyle McClure to the board. And a second by Vicki Kettlewell. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Welcome to the board. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Just in time, too. Welcome. Uh, yes. Welcome, Thank you all. Welcome. This is great. I'm so excited to have just more voices um, on the board and um, yeah, it's even with, with COVID um, it's been actually the, the, the board meetings have been some of the most sort of like exciting and uplifting and, and fun meetings as far as boards go that I've ever been on. And so I'm really excited to just have more voices going forward for the next year. So Yay. thank you all. Yay. And I just have one other quick comment to make and that is, um, Despite the fact that attendance on Zoom calls has been somewhat low, um, we still have had a fairly decent renewal on memberships. So I'm hoping when we can start to do more in-person things, we'll start to we'll start to see more people again uh, actively engage with with the group here. So uh, one of the things I would encourage all all of us who are on this call is to is to talk to other members or potential new members uh, to increase involvement uh, with SFA in the, in the coming months. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Deb's asking how many members we have currently. Fallon, do you know? Joe, anyone? I believe 60 something. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, 60 some. Mm -hmm. And certainly at our annual meetings or on our, our, sorry, our regular monthly meetings on the first Tuesday, you know, everyone's welcome. Um, we go through some business, but we, we talk a lot, you know, we, we have a lot of discussions on there too that are, you know, even if you're not on the board making decisions, um, if you got time, jump on sometime. Um, and we have a lot of fun. Yes, we do. Uh, Jim, three minutes. Can you give a forage console update? Jim sent me a private message that offered sure. to do that. Let's yeah, do that uh, real quick. The Forest Council has some events planned for the, um, for the spring and summer um, in our area. We're going to be at the Hollister Farm uh, south of Brainerd on April 19th and again on July 13th for a bale grazing workshop. Um, an early season one to kind of see what, what it's like at the end of the uh, winter and then, then the regrowth in July and all that has been impacted. Uh, doing the same thing on the Solberg Farm over by Verndale, <clears throat> north, north of Verndale. Those dates are April 27th and July 15th. They're in the evening, both, all those workshops. Go check out the Forage Council uh, Network Group page at SFA for those events. And then uh, at uh, Vicki and Greg's at Sunup Ranch, <clears throat> we're going to hopefully get in a workshop on uh, prescribed graze in a silver pasture site over there on the research uh, silver pasture site. We have the date set on that, so watch for that date. Um, that should be a good workshop and, or field day. And then um, I just want to mention um, that uh, we have applied through to the Grassland 2.0 program out of <clears throat> the University of Wisconsin um, as to be one of their uh, local learning hubs. And we got selected out of uh, uh, two. We got selected out of, I think it was seven or eight applications. Um, we're one of the top three that they're interviewing currently and trying to make a decision on which two they should go with. And they'll come um, some resources from UW and University of Minnesota and, and uh, a little bit of money to help with field days and stuff like that for the Forage Council if we get selected. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah, stuff going on there. So uh, Steve Flanagan over uh, West, and I don't have the date with me on that one, but that's later in September. Thanks, Jim. Okay, well. I, can I, I'll yeah, just. Go um, ahead. So we, we have a save the date card that I'm just putting together and we can um, uh, post that through SFA, of course, because we're a networking group. So that will kind of be a little calendar for everyone to see what the Forge Council is up to. There's a lot going on. This is exciting. There's a, there are a lot of opportunities to get out and see some really innovative things around farming. So, 
and the watch the silver pasture thing too. There are probably a dozen or more field days related to the two grants, uh, volunteer events, Savannah folk. If Savannah's up your alley, like, you know, you might have to travel a little bit out um, to Southern Minnesota, but there's going to be some pretty cool stuff going on um, down there. Um, yeah, there's just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's exciting that uh, coming out of COVID, there's a lot of opportunities to get together with people on farms. So keep an eye out. Um, let's move on. It's 10 o'clock. Wow. We just like, just hit that right on. Um, <laughs> uh, let's, let's move into our, our scheduled presentations uh, presenters for today. Um, first up is Stu Laurie. He's the uh, government relations director for the Minnesota Farmers Union. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about MFU priorities and maybe a little bit of a legislative update, whatever you want. Um, take it away, Stu. Thank you. Sounds great. Well, thank you for the time and thanks for letting me join. It's fun. I, I appreciate it. I don't know if Fallon sent me the link to join at nine and I hope that's okay. It's fun and inspiring to learn, uh, you know, all, all, all that you're working on and wheels are turning on ways that MFU can 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 support that work too. I also apologize if you kept if you uh, uh, cut Jim short for the sake of my presentation because I personally would much rather listen to Jim than my uh, legislative update. But <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll do my best to make it engaging. Um, you know, first by way of introduction, yeah, uh, Stu Lori um, do government relations for Minnesota Farmers Union. So. Um, you know, in, 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 in regular times outside of COVID, I am the guy at uh, the Minnesota State Capitol uh, for Farmers Union, pretty much full time during the legislative session, testifying on bills, making sure that legislators uh, understand what our members care about. Um, and, you know, I guess uh, relevant to I, I, I grew up uh, in SFA as well as Farmers Union. So some of my earliest memories, I grew up an hour south of Duluth, we did grass fed beef and we had an organic apple orchard and chickens and pigs and stuff. And some of my, my earliest memories were we had of SFA. This is why I know we were in SFA because we had a chicken bus that we shared uh, with the chapter, uh, like a, a mobile slaughter unit. So I remember going with my parents and I was always bummed out because my mom wouldn't let me ride in the chicken bus because it may or may not have been uh, roadworthy when we when we when we brought it from the Fisher Merritt Star Farm. So um, yeah, it's 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 fun to be here and I appreciate uh, Fallon reaching out in the opportunity. You know, other thing by way of introduction is like y'all got awesome leadership in SFA. I talked to Teresa Caveney, you know, probably you know, every other day <laughs> about various things that we're working on programming that we can support. Uh, Fallon's incredible. Uh, we talk all the time and she like, you know, is involved in every creative project. I always like think that I have something new that I'm working on. And then I talk to Fallon and she's like, oh yeah, we've been working on that for months and here's all the details that you got wrong. <laughs> and, and so um, y'all rule. So uh, I thought, and I can kind of hop around if this isn't useful, but I'd put together some slides recently for some of our members um, on kind of a federal policy update and then a state policy update and how that relates to um, what the feds just did with the American Rescue Plan. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about what M MFU is doing and, and, and other things related to that. Um, so awesome. Well, I will uh, hopefully successfully share my screen here. Uh, let's see, how do you present a PowerPoint? There we go. Can y'all see that? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Yeah, it's it's orange just because that's what uh, Google Drive sets you up with when you take the format. So hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully it looks good. Um, so uh, first, the the you know wanted to talk through the American Rescue Plan. So this was you know on on March 11th, um, Biden signed a 1.9 uh, trillion dollar uh, relief package. Uh, insider baseball, but y'all probably know it was passed through reconciliation. Um, that bas basically means that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a budget maneuver that allowed Democrats to pass this package without relying on any Republican votes and avoiding a filibuster. Typically, when you're passing policy, um, you need uh, 60 votes in order to break a filibuster or it needs to be, you know, widely supported. Um, so uh, this was a, you know, a key priority and it, it includes a lot of campaign promises from Biden. You know, it is narrower than some of what we'd heard talked about. 
um, uh, you know, throughout the campaign and in the early days of uh, Biden's presidency. Um, and that's basically due to the need to pass it through reconciliation. That said, $1.9 trillion is like huge, right? So, uh, you know, to put that into context, like, I think the federal, the entire federal budget in 2020 was 4.7 trillion. I said $1.9 trillion is huge. The, the federal budget in 2020 was like $4.7 trillion or something like that. That includes like, you know, funding the military and, and uh, you know, all of healthcare, um, you know, pass through to states, road funding, all that. This is $1.9 trillion that's going like basically directly into the economy. And that's on top of the CARES Act, which was 2.2 trillion and a $900 billion package that was passed in December. Much of those funds still aren't out the door. So big deal, uh, gonna be feeling this. And probably I was talking to a friend night before last and she was like, yeah, this is like a generational kind of impact. And I think we're just kind of numb to Congress doing these because um, uh, you know it's become uh, um, more common during COVID, but, and then I got a picture of the congressional, the de Democrats in the congressional delegation talking with the governor about what this is going to mean for Minnesota. Um, so the economy wide provisions that I'm sure y'all familiar with some of them. So I'll go through them quick, but you know, $1,400 per person payments, uh, phasing out starting at, um, folks who make, uh, 75 K, um, and that includes payments for dependents. So um, that's kind of uh, broadened eligibility, um, uh, continuation of the $300 per week, um, increased unemployment benefits, um, an increase to the child tax credit um, by around $3,000 um, per kid, um, $130 billion for school reopenings, $14 billion for vaccine distribution, um, an extension of health insurance subsidies. This is one important thing. If you were a spouse or a neighbor, um, uh, you know, uh, got laid off or lost your job during COVID, you know, be sure to keep an eye on healthcare.gov and look at what subsidies you're eligible for because that very well may um, change for the better due to the passage of this package. Um, and important for work in the state level, it included 350 billion for state and local uh, governments and, and tribal governments. Um, so the food and ag provisions, um, the, the, the package included uh, $4 billion um, for supply chain resilience. And you know, in the text of the law, this basically means everything from uh, providing PPE to uh, packing plant workers, to supporting farmers markets with modifications for this upcoming season, um, all kinds of things. One thing that you can keep your eye out for and let me know if you wanna watch is there'll probably be an opportunity to weigh in with USDA on what you feel like is most important for this funding. Um, so certainly uh, keep me posted on that if it's of interest. Um, one thing that it does say that Congress needs to do is they, um, I forget, I think it's like $100 million to pay for overtime for uh, meat processing inspection workers. That's one thing that we worked hard on at Farmers Union. One question that I got from an MFU member is, is that retroactive? It's not, it basically is for FY21 going forward, but there are some flexible state funds where we could maybe do that if it's needed. So if you're talking to your meat processing plant and they're like getting hit really hard with overtime, definitely let me know and, and, and there might be some, some, some help available. Um, there's $5 billion for socially disadvantaged farmers. Um, basically, you know, socially disadvantaged farmers in the federal level defined as black, indigenous, uh, people of color, um, and uh, folks who've been um, historically excluded from participating in USDA programs. Um, a little over 1 billion of that is for uh, technical assistance, training, uh, small grants to new producers, that sort of thing. And then 4 billion, the real bulk of it, is for uh, debt relief for uh, BIPOC farmers who currently owe money to the USDA. And that's up to 120% for those who, um, who, who owe money to the USDA. So that is a, a, a truly uh, significant um, investment. Uh, it extends the 15% increase to SNAP benefits, includes um, a little over 28 billion for uh, restaurant relief for folks who had their, their, their sales go down due to COVID. And then 
it puts uh, seven and a quarter uh, billion more in the paycheck protection program and also includes um, an increase to the economic injury disaster loan program, both at, at, at the Small Business Administration and both of which uh, farmers qualify for. So um, Teresa was saying that, um, but certainly if you haven't yet talked to your lender about applying for PPP, would very much encourage you to do so. Um, that is, you know, those, those loans are forgiven. We worked hard to make sure that farmers are eligible. Um, a little bit of a misnomer based on the changes that Congress made in order to make farmers eligible, but you don't need to pay anyone a paycheck to qualify. You can qualify as a sole proprietor um, and uh, you, you certainly should. You know, for folks who did uh, get PPP forgivable loans um, already, as I read the text, it doesn't make any provision for a third round of PPP. Really, that 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 funding is uh, for folks who haven't already received their first round or their second round. Um, and happy happy to talk more about that if it's helpful. Um, uh, final thing on the federal stuff, and I kind of alluded to this, but but important to remember too that there is a ton of money still sitting at USDA uh, that was passed in December and in previous relief packages that is yet to been spent. So there's about 15 billion allocated to a third round of the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, CFAP. Um, I'm hoping folks applied for that and were successful, particularly in the second round. Um, one thing that I hear from some folks and, and Teresa highlighted that there's a really good presentation that folks can watch about um, the second round of CFAP you know, everything that we've been telling our federal delegation is the second round worked well, you know, it would be good to have the, the third round modeled after that again. But, um, you know, one thing to know is uh, if, you know, last year you went on USDA's website and you, you know, read about CFAP1 and were like, oh, well, that's only going to apply to corn and bean folks and folks who are selling into the commodity market. So, you know, it's not for me. Um, they totally revamped it for the second round and they included a really um, strong list of specialty crops, um, different ways to demonstrate losses. You know, we have a lot of folks who got uh, payments out of that. So I would, you know, it's, it's almost unfortunate that they called it the same program first and second round because it's really totally different qualifications for the second round. Um, and then the, the, the second thing um, that is still at USDA that just thought I'd highlight is uh, the, um, there's 60 million in there for the Ramp Up Act, which was something that uh, Chair Colin Peterson championed and uh, National Farmers Union worked hard on. Basically what that would do is it'd be grants to meat processors who are currently um, custom exempt or uh, state inspected. And uh, sorry, we have a creative uh, doorbell <laughs> in my house. Um, but uh, it would um, give them grants to make upgrades for them to qualify for USDA inspection. So, you know, basically just another way for um, uh, meat processing plants to um, expand their capacity. You know, I'm also excited because we have a lot of money that's kind of on the table and being considered on the state level for meat processors. And I see the opportunity, you know, in all likelihood, these will be matching grants from the feds. Um, maybe we can pair those uh, so that if we have a, we can use state money to make the match, we can bring more of those federal dollars to Minnesota and help address the meat processing bottleneck. Um, so I was talking fast. That's a lot of numbers and I'm not good at math. I should stop. Anyone got any questions, thoughts, things they didn't cover? Either made a lot of sense or no sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was um, great, Stu. Thank you. Um, anyone on the, anyone jump in here? Um, I'll just say, um, I wonder, you know, meat processing is something that we constantly are kind of trying to address and we just keep hitting a wall over and over and over again on it. Um, feels sort of like a, recurring nightmare or something. Uh, um, so, you know, I feel like, you know, we really need to get creative somehow to address these issues. And so what, I mean, you know, one thing I've seen proposed was, you know, a policy change that would allow, 
I think it was something, a, a way in which custom exempt processors could be able to, I think it was called like the Prime Act or something like that. Can you speak to that a little bit and what maybe what Minnesota Farmers Union thinks about that and or other ways that we can like work outside the box a little bit? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's actually, it's an interesting conversation and a conversation that has developed within Farmers Union. You know, two years ago, we had, um, we had, uh, you know, a resolution brought forward, um, you know, on the Prime Act and, and we, you know, adopted policy in support of it. Um, and basically what it would do, you're exactly right. Um, it would allow states to elect to um, basically allow custom exempt um, slaughter facilities to um, uh, sell, uh, you know, into the marketplace, right? Right now that you have to uh, own the animal technically in order to use custom exempt. Basically the, you know, the, the, the main difference, there's some facilities requirements, Jim or others probably know better than I do because you've, you know, been in the thick of trying to start a meat processing plant. But the material difference as I understand it is you know for an inspected um state inspected or usda inspected plant you have an inspector there um inspecting the animal pre and post slaughter for safety and wholesomeness um and uh you know so we've had you know updated conversations you know that same person who brought forward that resolution on the prime act called me recently and was like hey reading more maybe that's not such a hot idea <laughs> Uh, you know, concerns that we have and, you know, and we have members and, you know, it's probably familiar who, you know, um, didn't, you know, have a custom processor do as good a job with their animals as they thought they should, you know, uh, those kind of things. And so there is, you know, value in having that standard of quality and having folks ensure that. The, the other important thing that, you know, I didn't realize y'all probably recognize is that, you know, the costs borne by processors are the indirect costs, right? So in Minnesota, the inspection program, it is paid half by the state and half by the feds. So there's no cost share to pay that inspector from the plant. That said, that the plant has to pay their, you know, employees to take freezer temperatures and to, you know, uh, fill out the paperwork and things like that. So there are those indirect costs. The one thing that they do have to pay is, um, is uh, overtime. And that's why, you know, we really wanted to get those, that money for overtime, because that's one thing that some plants do get hit with. In Minnesota, we got a pretty good inspection program. They try to be flexible with overtime, um, but, uh, you know, still important to have that money. Um, final thing that, you know, I think is really exciting. And again, Jim can comment on, but we're working really hard with Central Lakes College to get a meat processing technical training program started there. Um, and this is important because basically, you know, when the large packing plants went down, the Department of Agriculture in Minnesota and Tom Peterson, you know, this is his bread and butter. He came from Farmers Union. It's the number one thing he used to hear about. <laughs> and so he was ready to rock. And, and they basically surveyed all the state inspection, all the state inspected plants. They said, hey, you know, what can we give you to expand capacity? And in their words, you know, uh, a lot of those plants were willing to expand, you know, were willing to expand temporarily in some cases, um, could add some more equipment, but the real upper limit on how much work they were able to do was how many employees they have. And they were like, we can't find new employees, right? And so the, the plants are really excited about the prospect of a technical um, training program. The, the other thing, and this is you know, kind of still developing. So hopefully it doesn't, you know, or like I'm not given information that, you know, ends up not coming true. We're working hard to make it happen, but we want Central Lakes College to incorporate slaughter into their technical uh, curriculum. Cause as I understand it, that's really the bottleneck, you know, um, of the state inspected plants, there's like 55, 31 of them don't incorporate slaughter. They're taking in halves and quarters and making them into sausage. And so if you're a producer, you know, and you're trying to sell an animal, uh, you, you know, you, you need someone who's willing to take it off the hoof. And, um, uh, and so, uh, you know, incorporating slaughter in that technical training program could be really important. We also think that would be a creative way for the state to have some role in supporting some processing capacity. So for example, other states have, um, like, uh, have a cooperative agreement where, for example, a mobile slaughter unit provides some capacity for the college to use that facility for technical training, and then they help 
uh, you know, producers, like they serve producers with the rest of it. And so we're, we're, we're in early, but, you know, fast paced conversations with the Department of Agriculture and others about, hey, can we do that in Minnesota? Maybe get some help from AURI to, um, you know, partner with a private company to um, get a facility like that started too. So that was a long answer. I could talk for forever. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, um, hopefully some of it was, was helpful or interesting or new. Anything I got wrong, Jim or Fallon? Well, I guess I would just add a couple things. There, there is increased capacity in the state, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe that the numbers I heard from Tom Peterson, and I believe that was the SFA annual conference, um, it was a Saturday morning, I believe, was there's been eight new plants that have opened up since the beginning, opened up or expanded is the way I believe I heard it, since the beginning of, I don't know if it was last year of COVID, um and then there was three more to go online i heard one of those and maybe you know more dale but this was just west of wadena towards new york mills there's a new plan opening up i've just seen a little bit i don't know anything about it yet we we yeah. just heard something about it and so i don't know any more than that jim so the work we've been doing on pine and pine river we're really i think our focus has turned more to cooperative marketing <clears throat> and trying to work with a plant that either is willing to expand or or has capacity whatever that comes to but but you know getting enough uh volume that we can haul either you know large trailers or full trailers or, or semis to the processor and get a set date where we're hauling some significant animals it's it's really uh at least that's what i got out of our conversation vicky <laughs> a lot of it um before we look at trying to build processing in our area um so it's it's yeah this is really a there's a lot of work going into this right now. I know regional partnerships is looking at another study on it. Um, I think that's, I think that's locally here in the central region somewhere. So, and then with CLC looking at the, the, you know, filling that need for, for, for uh, meat cutters and, and that stuff. I think, I think a lot of the issues are being addressed. We'll see where they go. It's good to see all the activity anyway. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot, there is a lot of energy uh, and ideas. And uh, so I think we're getting to the more the synergy gelling process. That's um, I think where we're kind of at. And is that, is, was Bruton where the plant was that Jeff Shane was talking about? Might've been. That sounds... The new one? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if that's the one he was talking about or not. Okay. Anyway. Is anyone taking the lead on halal processing? Anyone know? There was some work going on with that. I don't know where that. I know is working on that at the state level. I think I think Kathy Drager and Ariel Kagan and folks who led on that for our DSPs in the department and the U still want to build on that work. I think they that was part of their. They submitted a USDA grant on that. You know, one thing I'm excited about, this is just two's two cents, but one thing I'm excited about, two things. One is uh, um, I think getting the solar developers involved in the halal and kosher conversation, because I think that could really, if you had the solar developers want to pay folks to graze sheep under their panels for vegetation management, and there's going to be some really big installations coming in. And when you think about, you know, standing up a, a new market, it could help to have that income stream and you kind of solve some of the land access problems too for um uh you know new immigrant communities if you have that kind of robust contract grazing network so i think that would be really cool for something one to look at the, the other thing jim i love you know one thing we're working on at farmers union is getting cooperative development grants reauthorized at the department of agriculture i think that could be a really key thing for meat processing again this stews two cents but not necessarily for cooperatives to start new processors, but to better use the capacity that we have through collective marketing. Because that's one thing that, you know, to the extent that I talk to processors, they're like, hey, we could take more animals or I could expand, but I need to know that I'm getting, you know, a thousand chickens every Thursday, you know, all year, or I'm not going to be able to do it. And so maybe cooperatives could be a way for producers to organize themselves in a way to better use the capacity to two cents and not, not, not the end all be all, but, and won't work everywhere, but could be helpful in some places. Yeah. We're working with um, Kevin Edberg from cooperative development services right now. 
And, you know, one thing that I've learned from him is that, I mean, I guess I've known this is carcass utilization and the value of that. And it takes volume to do that year round. You use 100% carcass utilization. Everything but the squeak, everything but the squeal, he says. <laughs> yeah, everything but the squeal. So, um, and that takes volume. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting topic, but it's, it, there's been a lot, there's a lot of work going on everywhere on it. And I think we'll get it addressed someday. It's going to take time. Uh, Kevin told us not to expect anything at all in the first year. Nothing's going to exchange hands in the first year of this process. Maybe the second year. Third year, you should be able to have something going. And it's probably going to be five years before you're going to get anything up, run, up and running. So, especially if it's processing. So, anyway. That's great. Thanks. I, I, I feel like, you know, that's really exciting to, to hear all of these sort of different elements around processing kind of coming together feels like maybe we're reaching some kind of tipping point on that issue. I do feel like, you know, what we've been talking about there is good for just the longer term stability of local food um, and smaller farms. But I also think that um, the disruption that, like, I don't think that would solve, you know, the issues that we had from COVID and the, from what I'm seeing, I just saw an article on NPR this morning that there are like thousands of coronavirus waiting, you know, just sort of like constantly spilling over. And it's only a matter of time before this happens again. And I really hope that the state is doing, is putting in some kind of like forward thinking five-year plan so that when this happens again, we have some emergency sort of like things that we can turn on that, you know, like maybe aren't standard practice, but we can like, okay, well, we got to keep this system going. So let's make this available. And like, we're going to help these processors do this for the next six months. You know what I mean? Like things that are ready to go. You don't have to talk about it. Just get it done. Because this was, we were extremely lucky to have processing dates far enough out to weather this. And a lot of folks were not, and it's, it's brutal. So I hope that there's that sort of long range planning to prepare for this again. It, it really should be building resilience by relocalizing the food system and <clears throat> particular meat processing because these meat processing plants, much like huge poultry or hog operations are avenues for viruses just to rage through the system. And so, you know, I, I agree emergency capacity would be great, but I'd rather see that be the ongoing capacity. Totally. I see a great opportunity in the St. Cloud area for halal processing and there's labor and there's demand. And I'm certain they still would need to build a supply of sheep and goat to have enough to run through a processing facility of any size. But it seems to me that um, if we could find someone to take a lead on that effort, uh, there's an opportunity there. And it's not going to be a group of volunteers from SFA that can actually get it done. It actually would take somebody fully focused on it. So I don't know, you know, Stu, if there's a way to get money coordination between the university and the state legislature, Department of Ag, to really yeah. get somebody focused on actually getting that done. Totally, totally. So I can talk through a couple of the, so one, the state is, the state is uh, um, planning to invest in meat processing. And I think there's an opportunity to get even more money too um, through the uh, federal, federal government. And, and, and then we're also, you know, we're asking for a significant amount of money for Central Lakes College um as well to uh, build that infrastructure i don't know are folks interested in seeing a couple more 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 boring slides about state state legislature or i guess i only got two more minutes i defer to tyler or fallon <laughs> yeah our next presenter isn't on yet so i think go well, ahead like yeah, go ahead. Talking, you know this is great so we'll just uh, we'll just watch for if ken joins or uh, and we'll we'll just we'll just watch for that thanks Okay, sweet. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go super quick through these. So, you know, basically 
obvious driving dynamics of the state legislative session. Number one, COVID-19. Number two, we now have a one-time budget surplus. That's largely due to that federal funding um, and due to lower state expenditures in the current biennium and a carry forward. So basically, you know, some parents aren't spending, sending their kids to school. Uh, the state doesn't have to pay for those kids to be at school. <laughs> so they're, they're saving some money. So it really is a one-time surplus. And of course, Republicans control the Senate, Democrats control the House. That partisanship is certainly uh, defines probably all the, all the work of the legislature. Um, uh, so yeah, that revised budget surplus um, now is uh, $1.6 billion up from a projected $1.3 billion deficit. Um, prior. Um, so that's hugely helpful. There's also uh, 4.9 uh, billion going to state and local governments in Minnesota. And so, you know, some of that will uh, surely come to the Department of Agriculture. And I know Commissioner Peterson is already looking for um, creative ideas for how to spend that money. So as you think through, you know, I'm always, it's probably maybe, maybe not the fairest, but I always feel like, you know, it can't hurt to ask Joel, but like thinking through creative projects, like how do you link that back to COVID, you know? And I think that's kind of the creative work that can help um, the, the, the commissioner uh, fund some stuff um, uh, with that funding. And to put those numbers in context, state, state budget for the last biennium was about $48 billion. So, you know, $5 billion is, is, is certainly significant. Um, you know, the budget bills, uh, the Senate has proposed a 0% increase to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, that effectively means a cut, right? Because that's the base functions, you know, making sure people aren't spraying, spraying pesticides or they're not supposed to, or, you know, inspecting uh, meat processing facilities. Um, but it, it doesn't include a lot of other uh, discretionary stuff that the uh, department has funded in the past. You know, things that they the Senate did here to their credit, and, you know, they might try to squeeze in is more money for meat processing. Everyone agrees that that is a priority, um, funding for farm to school, and then some various pass-throughs, which I don't think anyone here will particularly care about. Um, you know, in the governor's recommendations, he has a million dollars in one-time increase for funding for meat processing. That's on top of the, you know, million and change they typically uh, invest through the agri uh, value added program in meat and poultry processors. Um, they also are proposing hiring another state inspection staff. Um, so that's really important. What I always try to say is, um, and I really believe it, is that those inspection staff are the boots on the ground. They do a ton of work uh, working to get plants um, up and running, particularly through COVID. And Jim was saying, like, you know, they got, you know, eight plants expanded or, um, or, or, or started anew. Um, and that's, you know, beyond their scope of their kind of inspection duties, but they really um, lean hard into that and something I really appreciate. Um, there's some money in the ag budget for um, setting up a, a uh, like a pilot program for a carbon trading uh, kind of initiative in Minnesota. You know, I don't know, you know, I think there's good critiques on both sides of, uh, you know, uh, carbon markets. I think, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about and might be interesting to this group is I think, you know, some of the key problems with, uh, you know, um, a carbon market, um, you know, from MFU's perspective is how do small producers participate and how do you make sure that it's fair for early adopters and folks who are already doing the right thing on their land and that they can participate? I think the state doing a pilot um, could one, you know, help them figure it out and actually lead and we could have input rather than letting Land O'Lakes or Truterra or Indigo, you know, kind of write the rules for us because it's already here. People are already getting paid by them. Uh, but two, you know, big ideas. It would be really cool if the state at some point could serve as a pool for carbon credits for smaller producers. And this could serve as kind of a bridge for the state to do that. That's just my idea, but you know, welcome, welcome for feed, feed, feedback, but I think that could be really interesting and help solve some of those issues with how do you, you know, if you're on small acreage, how do you participate and make it worthwhile for, you know, Orlando Lakes or uh, Indigo to, 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 to contract with you. Um, there's some pilot funding for land transition, for industrial hemp, and for farmer mental health. I'll stop and see, is, is, is your guy on, Tyler? Yeah, Ken's here. So if this is a good stopping point, we'll switch. We'll switch Absolutely. Gears. Okay. Sweet. Or if you Thanks want to so wrap up, time. You know, if you got a minute, if you need a minute or something to wrap up, like, go ahead. That's fine, too. We're, oh, we're no. uh, I'll just say, I'll just say, um, I'll, 
Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was really fun to join y'all and, and, and see new folks. Hopefully we get to meet in person. I'll throw my cell and my email in the chat. Don't hesitate to reach out and tell me what I screwed up or uh, share some ideas. Really eager to stay connected and appreciate y'all's work. Thanks for the opportunity. Stu, thanks so much. Appreciate it. I just want to give a quick plug. Um, as yep. SFA is, you know, we're a farmer to farmer network. And so um, I think one thing that was brought up from our annual meeting last year was how do we pursue different policy initiatives that we want to also see move forward as a collective. And I think a partnership with Minnesota Farmers Union could help facilitate some of that. Um, Stu's amazing, does a lot of amazing work, and is incredibly knowledgeable and stays very involved. So if I would definitely recommend reaching out to him um, if you have the capacity to become a Fa Minnesota Farmers Union member and want to have some voice within policy, that's also a great way to do that. Um, and, <laughs> and as well as they have a new food shed app coming out through Minnesota Cooks to connect um, farmers to chefs. So that could be something to tie into a lot of this meat processing work and cooperative agreements and having large purchases go to restaurants after they're processed or something. So a few thoughts. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, and I'll kick it back to you, Tyler. That's great. Thanks to both of you. Um, yeah, let's just jump right over to Ken. If you're ready to share your screen, um, take it away. We have Ken Pentel here from the Ecology Democracy Network to speak a little bit about maybe that network and also the, the genuine progress indicator as an alternative measure of economy. Great. Uh, well, thank you uh, for having me. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm clear. And then, uh, yeah, I'm going to probably go to a screen share very shortly. But yeah, thank you for uh, allow me the time to talk about uh, the genuine progress indicator uh, the um, just to give you a quick overview the ecology democracy network uh, is born out of uh, kind of the work I've been doing most of my adult life I worked 11 years with Greenpeace 12 years with the Green Party run for political office um, you know and uh, about 2008 I uh, left the Green Party and I started the ecology democracy network uh, it's a, a nonpartisan um, uh, kind of what I call a laboratory <laughs> to develop a formula to reverse ecological overshoot on Earth or living beyond carrying capacity. And uh, the main focus, one of the main focuses of the network is to move from a human centered to an ecological centered point of view of the world as the position of strength on Earth right now. Um, and so that's the gist of the network. And we focus on, uh, and one of the things is, you know, one of the things that the reason I kind of left the uh, organizing I'd been doing before is I spent, I felt I was spending a lot of time chasing symptoms to dysfunctional structures. And so the network is about structural change in the economy, uh, how we pick our representation, and who influences our government. So no one of these things works in isolation from the other. Uh, the, uh, they, they intersect. Uh, so that's part of the gist of the network. And uh, the uh, main focus of the, um, the economic end of this is what we'll talk about today. But the gist is, is that uh, the uh, economic end is to basically end the idea of a growth imperative economy. Uh, basically, the dominant economic system is an open economic system on a finite biosphere or a growth, uh, you know, on a limited planet. <laughs> and uh, the goal of the network is to reverse this and move towards what we call an ecology based economy or a steady state economy. And there are two main drivers that we look at that are driving this overshoot on Earth. Now, when I talk about ecological overshoot, overshoot and I won't be able to cover, I mean, what I'm doing is cutting a lot of corners right now. So there's no way I'm gonna be able to cover the discussion that I would like to. Uh, that's a 10 hour discussion, you guys, and we don't have 10 hours this morning. So I won't go into my 10 hour wrap, but I will try to give you a synopsis of the discussion this morning, which is, you know, we'll try to cover it. But the gist is, is that it takes about 1.7 planets every year to provide our needs on Earth. Uh, and I bump up with the Ecological Footprint Network, 
uh, that's a source of information for me. Uh, they focus on overshoot day. And so the, basically we've accelerated rather rapidly on earth. The human, our growth on earth has rapidly grown. I mean, we've, uh, you know, it took about 250,000 years for the first billion humans to grow on earth. Uh, and after that, it took about 130 years for the next billion. After that, 30 years, 14 years for the next billion. The last billion took about 12 and a half years to grow on Earth. So the velocity of human growth on Earth is phenomenal. Uh, and in and of itself, is, <laughs> it's got historical momentum uh, that uh, is overwhelming the senses at this point on Earth. Uh, we don't know what to do with this growth. Uh, and then add in all the consumer products and all the artifacts, all the, the material inventions that we've created, that also has grown incredibly rapidly. So we've, part of the discussion today is that we're, this growth and this activity on earth is happening wittingly and part of it's happening unwittingly. And so I don't, I'm not here to, you know, cast absolutes on this discussion, you know, absolute you know, blame or whatever, but we're growing rather rapidly, not only on top of human population growth and consumption, but also interest rates are growing even faster than consumption. And now data as currency is growing faster than interest rates. So the velocity of growth is phenomenal. And one of the things is that uh, the dominant economic system that we depend on rewards growth for growth sake. It's a growth imperative. And uh, there's two drivers that we'll focus on today. One is the gross domestic product in the modern era is um, one of the drivers that uh, leads to more and more growth. Uh, and we want to replace that, my goal is replace that with the genuine progress indicator, alternative economic signal. And also we, <clears throat> <clears throat> the other uh, driver is interest bearing debt. So we focus on the monetary system, but we won't talk about that today. <clears throat> and we want to end the idea of interest bearing debt and move towards more of a uh, zero interest type of monetary system. Uh, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, today, we want to talk about the genuine progress indicator. And uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about, uh, we'll start out with um, the gross domestic product in the modern age. The gross domestic product was basically derived in the 1930s as a depression era measurement. Uh, the GDP, it, at that time known as the gross national product, I'm going to just make the GDP and the, gen, and the gross national product synonymous at this point because we don't have time to parse that out. But generally, uh, the gross domestic product is generally a monetary footprint within a domestic economy. That's the gist of it. There's many different definitions, but that's the one I'll use today. And the GDP was basically a, supposed to be an, a, 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 um, a, uh, um, a Depression-era measurement. It got carried over after World War II, and it became the dominant economic signal. When they basically, there was a gathering at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire in 1944 among allied nations. That's where the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the trade agreements were basically derived uh, at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire in 1944. Uh, and at that time, they decided the gross domestic product would be the dominant economic signal that would measure the economic volume of each nation on earth, basically. And so GDP went from a small measurement to the dominant economic signal on earth, and it sets pricing, interest rates and budgeting and gdp if we go two negative quarters of gdp it's a benchmark for a recession in the united states so it's a growth imperative gdp now gdp has a value like i say it shows a monetary footprint so if that is an indicator you want the gdp would satisfy that 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 objective but as a measure of economic well-being, it's a dangerous economic signal to follow. And, and you'll see, we've all, since we've all been living in the world, we see in the newspapers and the news, the GDP is always something people strive for. 
uh, to improve or grow. And this is not exclusive to the United States. This is not, ex you know, it, China, India, major countries on earth are chasing the GDP. Everybody is basically. And GDP, you know, the gist of the discussion today is what we're trying to do is uh, recognize that there, there's some deficiencies in the GDP, and that was also recognized by the inventor of the GDP, Simon Kuznets. And uh, one of the things I did want to play was a, um, was a, a video that also showed that uh, these deficiencies were recognized over time since the 1930s into the 40s. And one of those uh, has to do with, um, I'm pulling up a, a video right now, hang with me. Um, and I'm pulling up, uh, and this is Robert Kennedy, 1968. Um, and I'm going to get this. I, uh, there we go. Um, Are you able to share your screen, Ken? Yeah, I'm going to do this screen <laughs> share. Hang on. We see you have surrendered personal excellence. Hang on. Too long. We see you have surrendered personal excellence and community value. Hang on. Okay, so I'm going to do a it screen share. Uh, 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 too much and for too long. Hang on. We seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community. Sorry, I am here. I am to do a screen share. Can you see that? Yeah, I okay, can. Okay, hang on. Hang on, I'm gonna try to uh, get rid of my picture here on the. Uh... And this is uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, Kansas University. Oh my God, what happened to that? Um, I lost it. Hang on. Okay, 1960. For too long. We seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value and the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising, and ambulances to clear our highway of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jail for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic crawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our city. It counts Whitman's rifle and sex knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are American. So uh, that was um, Robert Kennedy, um, 1968. So this is not, this discussion is not a new discussion. It's uh, one that's been brewing for a long time. Back, so what happened in the mid-90s in Minnesota, a uh, gathering took place, a roundtable through uh, the legislature and the governor's office, the Department of Planning. They developed, uh, they had a roundtable on sustainability. Uh, hang on, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and so they had a roundtable and they came up with a report called Smart Signals. And in that report, 
uh, they recommended that Minnesota start moving away from using the gross state product or the gross domestic product and start moving towards the genuine progress indicator at that time. And that report ended up in the Department of Planning and the Department of Planning uh, was ended. So it never saw the light of day. Now, we should mention when people say, well, the gross domestic product is not, you know, like I say, it doesn't have major effects and so on and so forth. A couple of areas that just uh, glare are specific. One, prices. The gross domestic product sets pricing. So when people walk into a store, they see a pound of beef, you know, a dozen eggs, they see a gas, you know, they get a gallon of gas, you know, on and on we could go. It shows the price, but it does not show the cost. And that's one of the differences between the gross domestic product and the genuine progress indicator. The genuine progress indicator starts to internalize the cost of that product that we're buying at the store. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when we set the state budget, everybody who's looked at a state forecast will see on the second or third page, the first chart is the gross domestic product. That's how the state forecast is, is, is calculated, using the GDP. So when that sets, then the, then the governor's budget is put forward from there. And then all the committees work within that budget, basically. So it sets the tone for how we spend in the state of Minnesota. So the gross domestic product is very powerful. And this is endemic in all states in the country and all nations on earth, basically in general. And so um, what happened is they recognized the deficiencies in the GDP started moving to the January. Oh, Ken, I think we lost your audio. Okay, can you hear me? There it is. Okay, so since the Minnesota buried the Genuine progress indicator around 2000, 2003. It, 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 it never, and I dusted it off about nine years ago. I've been a student of this measure and what it, how the effects of, you know, how we do accounting in our system affects the health of the planet and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm still a student of this measure. But in 2010, Governor O'Malley in Maryland saw the value in the genuine progress indicator and established it through executive order. Um, and then Vermont passed it into law through their legislature, Washington State, Hawaii passed it into law, uh, and 20 states have done statewide GPIs for their states, uh, either through universities or through government. Um, and then about 30 countries have now done the genuine progress indicator calculations for their nation states. Uh, and so it's considered the most scientifically vetted alternative to the GDP on earth right now. And I'll give you a couple of examples of the difference between the two measurements to give you a sense of why I'm doing this. And like I say, I'm just cutting to the chase on this discussion because it requires, there's numerous moving parts here. And so I can't say I can make it simple, but uh, I'll try to give you a kind of a couple of examples that I like to use. And then from there, we can maybe have some time for discussion. One is let's take the Minnesota River watershed. For the last 80 years, the gross domestic product said grow food for volume in the watershed. And we did, we grew a lot of food. But there's no indicator in the measurement that said this groundwater cannot replenish itself. This topsoil cannot replenish itself. In the genuine progress indicator, probably late 60s, early 70s, it would have said, whoa, slow down or stop because this practice of growing food is now costing us because this watershed cannot replenish itself. So where the GDP does not recognize limits, the genuine progress indicator does. Did, did, that, did that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So let's take it a step further. We saw in the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of government activity bubbling up to do remediation on ecological overshoot, basically overusing, living beyond carrying capacity, contamination, 
you know, soil erosion, loss of biodiversity, all these things were happening at a very rapid rate in the late 60s, early 70s. And so government agencies bubbled up like the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we passed laws like Clean Water, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act. We saw the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, you know, Board of Water, Soil and Water, you know, PUC, EQB, all these agencies started bubbling up. And in the gross domestic product, all of these expenditures, which are generally considered defensive expenditures, money we spend on things to protect ourselves or save our lives, all of that in the GDP was just money being spent. So it shows up as a credit on the spreadsheet, not a cost. In the genuine progress indicator, accurately using double entry book keeping, credits and debits. In the genuine progress indicator, these defensive expenditures would be considered a cost, not a credit. So when you shift from a credit to a cost on the spreadsheet, you change incentive and you change behavior. Now it becomes less attractive to invest in overusing the watershed and far more attractive to invest in more restorative, regenerative agricultural practices. And so that's another difference in the way we measure the economy right now. Um, so is, did that make sense, what I just described? Okay, so you could take that application I just laid out for the Minnesota River watershed and you could apply it to energy. You could apply it to um, transportation, solid waste, all sectors are affected, health, and so on and so forth. So I, we won't have time to go into that, but the gist is, is that's one example, the difference between the two measures. Secondly, I'll give you another example. Let's go to Otter Tail County, one of my favorite counties in the state, but uh, somebody wakes up at 5.30 in the morning. They tend to the animals, the kids, the cleaning, the cooking, the mending, till nine at night for 40 years. In the gross domestic product, that activity does not show up because no money was exchanged. In the genuine progress indicator, we'd put a column in the state spreadsheet that would value household work. Because if we do not recognize the value of household work in the overall well being of our economy, then basically somebody who takes care of a home is de facto subsidizing those that are in the workplace. And so that's another difference with the, between the GDP and the genuine progress indicator. And this also would be endemic to volunteer work, for example. GDP does not recognize volunteerism. Genuine progress indicator does. So uh, that's another difference between the two measures. Did, did that make sense, what I just described? Okay, so, and there's numerous ramifications on that. We won't have time to go into today, but that's a key issue that we have to deal with. So one of the things that I am concerned about and uh, in relation to the way we measure the economy, and like I say, this is not exclusive to Minnesota. This is endemic around all the United States and around the world. But let's re remember, on earth right now, um, 20% of the world's population is consuming 80% of the world's resources. So we're not talking about this extreme excess extraction on everybody. That means 80% of the world's population is only consuming 20% of the world's resources. So we need to, in many respects, a lot of the major problems we're facing on earth in relationship to using up this planet and, and squeezing the last of the last out of it, um, is exclusive to generally about 13 countries on Earth. Uh, so US, Russia, China, Brazil, Japan, Australia, and mostly Western European countries. They're the biggest consumers on Earth. But one of the problems with the way we're measuring the economy that's creating incredible stress is the way we measure now, we undervalue local and rural economies, and we overvalue urban suburban economies. So in Minnesota, 
80 years ago, we had about 52% rural population. That's now down to about 17%. And according to the state demographer, that trend's going to continue for the next 40 years. We're going to add a million people to the metro region over the next 40 years. And we're adding 2 million people to cities each week on earth right now. And so what we're seeing is this incredible migration over the last 80 years from rural to urban. And one of the drivers of this is the way we measure the economy. Because in the metro regions, as they grow, more and more people require external resources for survival. They pay money for energy, food, transportation. This triggers the GDP. And the GDP says that's where value is. In rural economies, people are much more self-reliant, self-sufficient, longer distances, valuable activity, but not valued in the way we measure the economy. And so the GDP is creating incredible extremes between rural and urban right now on Earth. We can see major cities just ballooning on this planet, Shanghai, Beijing, Mexico City, Lagos, Los Angeles, New York, you know, on and on we could go. And this is creating, and most of the people in these metro regions require massive external resources that they're detached from the consequences of their dependency, basically. So we don't, they don't, a lot of people just don't know what the impact is on their daily life <laughs> dependencies. And this is a huge risk on earth right now. The genuine progress indicator would reverse this trend it would start to have more accurate accounting that would start to lead towards localism, rooted communities, reducing the need for people to migrate. Because you know, if you create incredible stress in rural economies on earth, you, know, you can dangle $650 million of polymet money in front of a desperate economy. And yes, no, those people do not want to poison their water, but yes, they do want their children to live there. They want the health clinic, they want the library, they want the housing. So basically the way the economy is working now, a lot Lost you again there, Ken. So what's happened is no, people do not want to be given bad choices, but the way the economy is working now, it forces people into incredibly bad choices that are, are using up this planet at a rapid rate right now. And so that's why I'm very concerned about the conditions we're facing on this planet and the main driver, the way we do accounting, the way we do math, the signal we follow right now is the gross domestic product and the genuine progress indicator would be a remedy to the deficiencies in the GDP. And so what's happened the last four cycles, and I'm cutting to the chase because I know we're, you know, guys, uh, time uh, crunch here. Um, we have two bills, last four cycles in the House, we've had a bill uh, and in the Senate to offer an alternative spreadsheet to policymakers in Minnesota. It's uh, House file 995, Senate file 905. Um, and basically what it would do, it's, it's, a, it's a soft approach, but it offers policymakers another picture of the economic well-being of our state. And it would be a side-by-side -side spreadsheet that would come out annually, that would alongside the state forecast that comes out in November and February. And it would offer policymakers a different picture of what we're doing economically in this state. And that's the gist of what I wanted to talk about today, is just to give you a taste of what the impact is on how we do accounting in our society. Because a lot of people don't want to find this to be an abstract discussion, whatever. But like I say, you got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in Minnesota, hundreds of millions of people on earth walking into stores every day and they look at the price of things. And if that price does not include the cost, if a gallon of gas does not include the cost of CO2, you know, if you know, a pound of beef does not include the cost of 
all the inputs associated with it, you know, the hormones and the antibiotics and the fertilizers and the pesticides and the herbicides, if it's not in the bottom line and the whole cost is not in the bottom line of these prices or the ecological truth is not in the bottom line, there, no matter how many good models or samples or examples we put out there to take care of the earth, it has nothing to do with meeting the scale of the problem we're facing. The GDP is the macroeconomic signal for Earth right now. If we don't change that measure, whatever goodness we try to create in relationship to healing our relationship to this planet will be overwhelmed by the dominant economic signal that everyone's chasing on Earth right now. It's like climbing a greasy rope. I want to get there. I've been working on sustainability for 35 years of my life. And I've utterly failed in relationship to achieving that. Because in that lifetime, we've lost 50% of the world's wildlife. Right now, we've gone from 100 years ago, 15% of hum humans occupying 15% of the Earth's surface. We now occupy close to 80% of the Earth's surface. And 50% of that Earth's surface is being used by agriculture right now. And what saddens me the most is the people that are healers, people like yourself, healers of the land, because of Cargill or a ConAgra or a Monsanto or, or whoever, Smithfield, whoever these days, can externalize costs, can use the GDP to game the system. They overwhelm people that are doing the better work on earth. People that are the healers of the groundwater, the topsoil, the biodiversity, and still growing food. And it pains me to see that these interests continue to plow under all this good practices and good people that are trying to restore and regenerate our relationship with this planet. So that's why I think this is a critical discussion. Uh, and I'm trying to get groups to adopt this measure, the genuine progress indicator. It's imperfect. I don't agree with everything. Uh, I would add my own little indicators in there, but generally it's a, the genuine progress indicator is a triple bottom line measurement, economics, social, environmental. It's holistic. It's well vetted and it's practiced by people all over earth. So this is why I think this is a critical time that we start to rethink how we do accounting on this planet. And this is one of the steps that we can take to change that. And so thank you for your time. I'm open for questions. Uh, I cut a lot of out. <laughs> Ken, thank you. Really appreciate it. Very yeah. illuminating. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah, to, to the members in, you know, on, on here now, go ahead um, with any questions. Lots of questions. Vicki, you got some? Ken, I'm oh, wondering oh. if you... No, go ahead. Sorry. I guess my question for Ken is, uh, do you give the 10 hour version? And if so, how would we access that? Well, I've got, um, I'm not a 10 hour version, but I, I'm offering uh, Zoom meetings uh, whenever people would like them. So they can call me and we can arrange a Zoom meeting um, for you individually or your group or people that you're associated with in any way. Uh, and so that would be some way to do it. I've also got a calendar I can send you. I've got some meetings coming up this next Wednesday, and I've got another one. And I also talk about governance, but that's another discussion. But, um, and then I've got another one coming up on the 30th. So uh, they're, they're about, you know, 45 minutes an hour presentation on the GPI. And we talk a little bit more about the other indicators in the measurement, but yeah either directly contact me via my email, Ken Pentel at Yahoo, or my phone number, 612-387-0601, 612-387-0601. And I'm willing to chat with people as long as they like. I've met with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times I met with legislators in Minnesota the last nine years. I've moved both parties. This is not a partisan discussion. This is about math. Let's go back to the Minnesota River watershed. That point where the watershed can no longer replenish itself, okay? Where that, uh, 
uh, with that watershed cannot replenish itself. People that want less government, taxes, and regulation, and people that want sustainability have to make a decision. Because if we continue to grow beyond the ability of that watershed to replenish itself, then neither can be achieved. You can't achieve less of anything, and you can't achieve sustainability. And what I've seen in the environmental movement my whole adult life, and I wasn't fully aware of it, and I'm willing to admit my weakness and failure in this, but what I've recognized is that the environmental movement is tinkering within a growth economic model on a finite biosphere. And that's not gonna sustain anything. We have got to go towards a steady state economy. And that's what the genuine progress indicator moves us towards, a steady state economic system. And so that's the gist. So where the economy grows and decomposes in balance with earth, that's the way the measure should lead us. Vicki, go ahead. Questions, Vicki. Well, this is, um, actually this is, and I'm, maybe you have, but um, I'm struck that your uh, presentation would make a fantastic TED talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've done one of those? Or, yeah. or, I've never done it. No, I, I, oh, but I, I'm going to be, I'm going to listen to a TED talk tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning from Europe, but uh, no, I'm not, I've never done a TED talk. Well, I think if there's an opportunity, I think it would have a good reach. <laughs> you should have an SFA yeah. TEDx conference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Minnesota. I'm open. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I've been working pretty much not, not, th there are people all over earth doing this work. So I don't want to assume I'm doing it, but in Minnesota, not many people are discussing this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not really a top of the discussion, but because um, generally, once again, we've been, I spent 30, close to 30 years chasing symptoms to a dysfunctional structure. I refuse to do that anymore. If we're going to solve this problem of ecological overshoot or living beyond carrying capacity, we have to have structures that meet the scale of the problem we're facing or else it can't be solved, period. Mm -hmm. We just keep chasing our tails uh, and I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, you know, and so that's why it's tough because there's a lot of people I care about and uh, love their work, but uh, the, once again, it, 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 once again, the most important thing is the work you're doing, for example, on sustainable agriculture. Once we hit a tipping point, once people's, the pressure grows on earth, because we have a growing population on a shrinking planet. And so the pressure is growing, which makes the work that's been going on to restore and regenerate our relationship to the earth becomes much more clear to more and more people under pressure. So that's when people ask me, how is this going to change? How are we going to change the dynamic? Generally, my take is when suffering hits a tipping point, then transformation will happen. And that's painfully sad. But from my point of view, that's one of the truths that's coming out of all this uh, ecological pressure we're facing right now. Ken, I would just like to say hi. It's been a long time since I've seen you, and it's good to see you, my friend. Um, <laughs> Jim, Jim, now let me ask you, did I improve on my face plant from 2004? Yeah, you've refined your message, Ken, and it's good <laughs> to have you bring me back to reality and where we need to be headed. It's, it's uh, thank you. So thank much. you. Um, yeah, yeah. So, no, hey, those, great to see you, Jim. Great to see you. Yeah, can you repeat those uh, files and do you know their sponsors? Yeah, so it's House File 995, Chief Author is Representative Schultz out of Duluth. Okay. She's a healthcare economist, uh, and she picked up on this right away. She basically ignored me and then called me three days, three months later and said, Ken, I'm drafting a bill. Uh, <laughs> so she's like, she's, she gets this viscerally. Uh, and then in the Senate, uh, Senator Marty was the chief author recently, and then it's been passed to Senator Fateh is now the chief author. Uh, and he, um, and then Senator Marty is second co-author we have a full slate in the Senate. My focus has been trying to get the Senate to adopt, uh, get this discussion going in the Senate, because then that will give the House uh, a reason to get together as well. So I've been trying to get both parties, uh, both bodies to get hearings on this bill. I need help in moving that agenda. Um, and then- Senator Root on this all? 
I've contacted her, but not been able to meet with her. Okay. Um, and so I've met with pretty much every senator and House member, you know, probably, let's say about 150 of them uh, over the last nine years, time and time again. And we do, should, I should mention that Representative Omar, uh, my representative, is going to introduce a national genuine progress indicator that is uh, going to be far more visceral than the state one. So what's going to happen is that Representative Omar's bill, which should be introduced in the next week or two, um, will get, right now the state bill in Minnesota would have the University of Duluth along with the Center for Sustainable Economy out of Portland, develop the spreadsheet. On the federal bill, it would happen within the Bureau of Economic Analysis within the US government. To me, that's a far better approach than having a university do it. I would prefer the state do it. Uh, but right now I'm taking what I can get. What, what seems to, I guess this is more of a comment, um, and I guess what seems to be the best uh, examples of where this plays out is in the urban credit rating um, aspect and this the inefficiencies in a in a in a pollution trading scheme like that. Right. Uh, as far as return on investment, it's it's a terrible return on investment on your dollars to try to do a cap and trade program versus a regulatory approach. Um, and I, I just think if that, I, I've had that discussion with other folks and they speak to social good and how cap and trade can, can you know, get the public buy-in and that's the only way we can really move the needle. Where with the, what I see is with this, this uh, progress, progress indicator, you know, that takes that whole argument off the, off the table and, and just looks at it from a different direction. I don't yeah, think- I'll yeah, give you a quick example, Jim. Let's take a forest. In the gross domestic product, a forest is only valuable when it's cut and turned to product, timber or chipwood. In the genuine progress indicator, a forest is valuable in and of itself, fixing carbon, fixing soil, filtering water, habitats. So now people that take care of their forests on their land would have tax value increase in relationship to protecting the biodiversity of that forest. And we could then start to establish corridors again. Uh, wildlife corridors inherent to the measure. So the incentives inherently lead you to restoration, you know, biodiversity, wildlife corridors, things like that. And so that would be a natural outcome of the measure itself. Does that make sense? Yep. And it meets scale. And I have spreadsheets, you guys. So I, if you ever want more information, I've got tons of reports from around the world and in the U.S. And so I've got a lot of stuff. And uh, there was a recent report, you know, and, and I won't go into more detail. Questions or thoughts? Anyone have any more questions or ideas? Or I just open. have a one thought. Our chapter. Yeah, sure. Our chapter's talking about a, a climate working group. So I think this would be a relevant discussion. <laughs> yes. So and timely. So thank you. Oh, definitely. I agree. I agree. Any more thoughts, anybody, or questions? No, Elizabeth? No, no I, I would. Um, oh, you just cut out there. Just, oh, here we go. I would just um, comment that I had a conversation about this with my, with another nephew of mine who is a senior at the University of Duluth. And he was telling me about his, some of his economics courses that did talk about the genuine progress indicator and about the, um, the problems with the GDP. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I, was, um, I was happy to hear that. <laughs> good, I, good. I yeah. And I, well, I appreciate the, the work that you're doing, Ken. Thank you. You've used the word failure a couple of times in re, in you know in relation to your work, but um, I think that the work that you're doing is important. And uh, thank you for doing yeah. it. And uh, let's see what happens next. Yeah, and and I, what I want to do is just I know you guys got time crunch, but I want to give you one more example of the difference between the two measures in the economic sphere. 
before I leave. One has to do with, um, let's say Hennepin County. Let's say one person in Hennepin County gains all the benefits of productivity. The GDP could improve because it does not care about allocation of resources. In the genuine progress indica indicator, it uses marginal utility. So $1,000 going to somebody making $40,000 a year has a different value than $1,000 going to somebody making a million dollars a year. So where the GDP does not recognize income inequality, the genuine progress indicator does. So when things become unequal, the GDP, the genuine progress indicator starts to fail. And that's a, you know, an accurate assessment of the overall balance or economic well-being of our society. And so that's the gist of what this measure is. It's about balance, you know, trying to get an ecological, social, and economic balance on this planet. Because right now, the GDP is feeding the extremes at a higher and higher velocity. And if we don't stop using that signal, it's painful. Uh, for many, many people. Well, and once again, great. go ahead. All right, Tyler, thank you. Thank you, you Ken. And yeah, Bob, I'll, thank I, you. I'll suggest that we maybe bring this up at our next board uh, meeting for some further discussion as the board to, um, you know, figure out, yeah, whether, you know, how much, what we want to do going forward. We want to gather more information and connect with Ken on some, you know, deeper dives or do some more research kind of thing and, and ways that we can help support those two bills if we want um that sort of thing so that's coming yeah. up here real soon yeah that would be great uh thank you and of course there's so much more to talk about but i'm really grateful for your work um and uh, uh, we'll keep in touch anybody can contact me anytime we can talk further about this i mean i've given you really a shortcut on this discussion so really great thank you Ken. We had another hour to talk about your ideas on election reform ken that would be really awesome but <laughs> oh yeah no i've got presentations coming up on that too on my calendar so if anybody wants my calendar contact me via email ken pentel at yahoo and i'll send them the calendar so all right Thanks, ken. Yep. take care thank you all thank you very much keep up the good work sure. well everyone thank i you. think uh we have to run. We got to get to the farm here and do some chores. So um, unless someone has a burning comment, um, this was a good meeting. Thank you all. Thank you. And welcome to the new members of the board. And we'll see you on, uh, what did I say? The 6th. We'll see you on the 6th at 7 p.m., right? Good. 7 p.m. 7 Yep. Thank you, everybody. And if you want to join for our last um, discussion on the future Earth, and we will be sending out an article for the book club, that is the first Monday of the month. And so that'll be on um, April 5th at 7 p.m. Yep. So, yes. So please let me know if you want to attend that, and I will add you to the list as well. Thanks so much for the time, Thanks, everyone. time today. Enjoy the rest Thanks, of the week. everyone. Very good. Bye. Excellent. Bye.